Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Anand. <laughs> thanks, Anjali. Uh, that was very motivational. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about anything half as motivational as Anjali. Um, mine is going to be more hands-on, applied approach to merchandising because that is what I have been asked to speak about. Uh, now, essentially, to give you a short background, and uh, uh, you can stop me when I start boring you, um, is I actually belong to the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, I've been in the industry for 32 years. Uh, most of you probably, or many of you probably, weren't born even when I started working in this industry, which was in 1979. And we didn't have merchandisers then. We were just called coordinators. And we did everything. Okay, The first day when I joined my job, uh, one of my colleagues said, don't have very high expectations because a coordinator in this business is from doorman to chairman. You do everything that comes in between. And essentially, I think that's what merchandising is all about. Doorman to chairman, we do everything, right? When the chairman's not there, we even represent the chairman on behalf of the company. So essentially, I'm actually going to start off, this was supposed to be an interactive workshop, but because we're running out of time, keep it quick and short. But there are a couple of things that Anjali touched upon, which I think we need to revisit to understand merchandising best practices. How many merchants sitting here? They're not called merchandisers anymore, merchants. Hi, 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 hi up. Be proud to be a merchant. Whoa. That's a full house. So who are you? Who are you? Who's a merchandiser? Who's a merchant? How would you explain yourselves, for those of you who are not married, to your future mother-in-law? I'm a merchant. Tokano. Who's a merchant? How do you execute? How do you execute? How do you coordinate? What are you doing right now? How do you tell your buyer you're a coordinator, you're a merchant, that she should trust you or he should trust you, that you will deliver what he wants of you? You're a communicator. Very, very important. A merchandiser is a communicator. Anjali spent about a good part of half an hour explaining to you about communication. Now, of course, she talked about active listening. However, I think communication is a two-way process. And she did touch upon that. She said, paraphrase and clarify. So you have to send a message out, and you have to receive a message and send it out and receive the message. But in the process, you have to listen and communicate. Next, who is a merchandiser? That's part of being a communicator. Oops. Ooh. Thinking from buyer's angle. Once you communicate, you know who your buyer is, right? You know what your buyer wants. So now you have to develop what he wants. I think Pooja mentioned this morning, she said, the modern day merchandiser needs to have a very strong understanding of design. I would take that a step further and say, not just design, she has to and sorry, I use she because it's not that I'm biased, but somehow all merchandisers have always been she's. I have nothing against boys, quite honestly. Um, she has to be a product person. Okay, So product development goes beyond design. And a merchandiser has to have a very strong product sense, 
which would include product design sense, the raw material aspect of it, the product putting together aspect of it, okay, and also the intangibles of products. What is it that attracts a buyer to buy a product, a buyer's consumer to buy a product? So that you can only know if you are an all-round product developer. So it's not like my buyer wants blouses, okay, let's get blouses for her. No. Why does my buyer want blouses? Who does she want to send those, sell those blouses to? When does she want to sell those blouses? At what price does she want to sell those blouses? Are they for young women or older women? Are they for maternity wear or are they for leisure wear? Why is she buying these blouses? Right? How many of us ask these questions? when the buyer sends a sample? One, two, three, four. Oh, lots of product developers. Salesperson, right? Is a merchandiser a salesperson? Yeah? We all sell. Sometimes we hard sell. Sometimes we oversell. And then the buying agency says to you, why did you commit one lakh pieces when you have the capacity only to produce 60,000? I don't care. Shipment still has to go on the 31st of October. Right? We're very good salespeople. Most of us merchandisers are excellent salespeople. Now, to be good salespeople, again, we need product knowledge. We have to be good communicators. Finally, what all of you have been saying, coordinator. What does a merchandiser coordinate? Pardon? And? Internal and external agencies. Internal and external agencies. Speed with quality. But what you said succinctly puts the whole activity together. You coordinate or you are the interface between your company and all external agencies that are dealing with your company. Now, when we say this, we talk front-end, which is the buyer and his whole ilk, okay? And we talk back-end, which is the production, the supply chain, and the source, okay? And the merchandiser is the interface, it's the nodal point, that is where everything comes in and then gets sent out and then comes back in and then gets sent out again. A merchandiser is a buyer? Yeah? Right. In the buying offices they're called merchants but they're actually buyers. They're representing your buyers. So merchandiser, your buyer is a merchandiser, right? Because she or he is the interface between the customer or the consumer of the products and the manufacturer. All of us are actually in the entire chain that connects the product from the manufacturer to the ultimate consumer are actually carrying out merchandising functions. Merchandise is a shipper, right? We have to be documentation wizards, even though we have a Mr. George or a Mr. Thomas or a Mr. Vergis sitting in the documentation department who seems to know everything from LCs to banking to the works. But he will say, Madam, have you checked the papers? before you are giving to me and sending to buyer. But the credit goes to Mr. George. Right? The merchandiser is the shipper, actually. You're the one who's telling the buyer, shipment has sailed or flown, wide airway bill number so-and-so, invoice number so-and-so, and so on and so forth. Even though the honest truth might be that it's still on the cutting table. But never mind. Buyer doesn't know that. So it looks like the merchandiser is a jack of all trades. Again, something that Mr. Beda said this morning, right? He said, oh, 
the work that the merchandisers do is phenomenal. We look something like this. Sorry, boys. No wrong intentions, but I think sometimes our lives, not sometimes, all the time, our lives look like that. Right or wrong? Do you agree? Right? So essentially, now let's get serious. What is the role and responsibility of a merchandiser? Because if we don't understand thoroughly the role and responsibility of a merchandiser, we don't understand what the best practices are. Right? See, there's a merchandiser. She's listing it all down. Buyer contact and communication. You are the face of the company. All right? Every piece of information about the company, the products that the company makes, goes from you to the buyer. Therefore, the buyer's understanding of the company, and today now with companies really go growing in size, it can't be a Mr. Gupta or a Mr. Agarwal or a Mr. Jain, the owner of the business. Right? You. Very often you will find, when, when we were young, we had a Mr. Jindal or somebody above us who used to be the front man. All right, and we were the little foot soldiers who did all the work. But today, each merchandiser is accountable for the accounts that she handles because businesses have grown so much. And therefore, we need to understand that contact with the buyer and the kind of communication that is taking place between the buyer and your organization is very, very important. How you practice that is very important. We're going to visit that a little later, as soon as I've listed this. The second aspect today where the merchandiser has to play a very active role, otherwise you will become organizations which are CMT organizations. Okay? If you want to be an organization that actually dictates and directs the garment business, your product strengths have to be very, very strong and your product development strengths have to be very, very strong. Okay? So the merchandiser has to play a huge role in product development. Even though the garments or the merchandise might get made in the sampling department, where you might have a whole team of these very fancy salaried designers from NIFT, but ultimately you are the interface between the buyer and the rest of the company. You know what the buyer wants. You know that he wants cambric, or you know that he's only going to buy voil, or you know that he's only going to pay $14 for that blouse and not a penny more. Okay? You know that he likes embroidery done in a particular way. You know the kind of packaging requirements he has. And product development is not about beautiful pictures on a drawing sheet. Okay? Product development is hardcore, three-dimensional merchandise that can be bought and sold for profit. Okay? So it's a very, very important area of a merchandiser's function. Most of us tend to take it lightly. Most of us don't use our mind when the product development process happens. But I think all of that is changing. Okay, uh, today it becomes very important for us to become proactive and preemptive. Okay, because um, the other day I was doing a lecture for my students at Pearl, and when we were actually charting out the product life cycle, we realized because of the speed of fashion now, product development is actually 70%, it accounts for 70% of the life of a product. You spend anything between nine to 12 to 9 months developing a product, manufacturing it and selling it, which will sit on the shop shelf at full price for six weeks. After that, it goes into the markdown basket. Okay? So you can imagine you have this huge market out there which is hungry for merchandise. Okay? Uh, it's a bit like that Pac-Man. You know, the game that we play, chomp, 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 and everything goes out of fashion, okay? You've got to have your finger on the pulse of fashion. People like Zara or H&M today are successful because they 
practice fast fashion. They're able to keep consumer interests alive. So imagine if you're a supplier who's producing uh, for Zara, if you are able to support their product development efforts by your own research and product development abilities, uh, how much better you can facilitate that entire fashion value chain. Costing and pricing. So boring. Ho jayega. This is the part of the job we always say. Samples to banao pehle. Costing to buyer ke samne bhi baith ke ho jayega. Right? I've sat with buyers across the table from merchandisers who've had beautiful collections up there. And the buyer has selected the pieces, laid them on the table and said, all right, let's talk money. Merchandise is very excited. 19 pieces have been pulled out. Mira, how much is this? Oh, this blouse. Hang on a sec. Pulls out a tape. Then she's not too sure. Fabric looks expensive. Tuck, 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 tuck. Hello, Master Ji. Jira buying room mein aayenge? Poor Master Ji comes. Master Ji also goes. <coughs> Diameter lelo, madam. Sure, Master Ji, diameter mein bad jayega. Menga hai kapra. Fir upar niche price jayega, fir Sharmila ji gussa karengi. Teek hai, madam, fir paune teen meter pei kar do costing. So she starts. Oh ho. Then she goes through her fabric file. Price of fabrics missing. Bip, 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 bip. Gupta ji, jara upar aayenge. So Gupta ji comes. <laughs> Kitne mein milega? Madam, grey to shed 35 rupees meter mein mil jayega. Gupta ji, processed fabric ka price pataiye. Bayer betha hai. Acha. Laga lije. 48, 50. Acha. Take hai. Pone 10 meter, 48 rupees a meter. We are calculating. Okay. Buyer is told. 16 dollars. Buyer says you must be crazy. One minute. Bip, 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 bip. Okay, and so we go through. We've got 19 blouses. Familiar scene with everybody? Right? So by the time we've reached blouse number five, buyer is not interested anymore. All right, fine, cost all these later on and send me the samples. What have you lost? You've lost orders. All right, you've lost orders because the guy has got bored with Master G, Gupta G, U G, and everybody standing there and trying to cost merchandise. Costing and pricing is a very, very important aspect of merchandising. Today, competitive world, every cent counts. Every cent counts. And yet, it is an area of function we tend to take very lightly. Very lightly. Okay, you've got to understand how the buyer further costs and prices the product once you've given him a costing. Okay, so when you come back and say, oops, Sharmila, I made a mistake. I actually need a hike of 15 cents on that blouse. And my buyer freaks. Okay, and you'll turn around and say, Sharmila ji, Aapke buyer itne khadus hai. Pandra cent ka kya farak padta hai? Pandra paise hi to hai Ameriki paiso mein. Fifteen cents makes a lot of difference because he's calculated his duty on it. He's calculated his freight on it. He's calculated his markup on it. He's calculated his markdown factor on it. Now as merchandisers, therefore, it becomes very important for you to understand how does your buyer price his products. Okay. Similarly, I've had cases where merchandisers, when I was on the production side of it, tells me, ma'am, you know, bada bhool ho gaya. Actually, bada bhool nahi hai, chota bhool hai. I forgot to cost the labels. Okay. Labels ke kitne paise hai? Ek rupay per piece hai. Maximum dead rupay. Ek lakh pieces ka order agar a gaya. तुम्हारी छह महीने की सैलरी है लेबल्स का कॉस्ट। अरेंट। नाउ दिस हैपेंस व्हेन द वर्क इज़ नॉट डन करेक्टली। मोस्ट ऑफ़ अस डोंट रियलाइज़। आई मीन यू नो, 
why is my boss being so antsy about the fact that I forgot to add one rupee fifty pesa on the cost of the garment? Okay. Selling and booking of orders. This is something, again, a very important aspect of merchandising. Okay. Again, an area that we tend to take very lightly. Okay. Most of us, as merchandisers, and as she said, we don't know what to eliminate. Okay. So even though we know buyer is coming for appointment sharp at two o'clock, okay. Buyer arrives, we are still grabbing our notebook, we are still grabbing our tapes, we are still grabbing our whatever, and then dhar dhar dhar, running into the showroom or buying room or wherever it is. So we sit down and start taking notes in our diary, in our own shorthand. Simultaneously, we are cutting swatches, we are also doing the hard sales pitch, we are also calculating and everything. All right? And then the buyer works with us for four hours, five hours, six hours, whatever number of hours. We are tired, we are exhausted. He's gone home. Good buying meeting. The guy's picked up 25 samples. He's actually reordered on three of the older styles. And he's given you an extension on the shipping and Falana and everything. All in all, it's been a fantastic meeting. OK, boss also says, well done. Then it's Sunday. Jao, moj karo, Sunday enjoy karo. Diary band hua, table ke upar rakhe, chal diye. Monday morning when you come back, 30 emails, things piled up on the table because you had spent the whole of Saturday afternoon with this buyer. You only get a chance to open that diary at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the evening. The diary looks like it's been written in Egyptian. Now, which one swatch was taken? This Pantone color number I have written right, but it's not in Pantone book. I've actually had suppliers ring me up and say, Sharmila, which one was brown? How do you say which one was brown? Swatch is gone. A small swatch. Buyers are very stingy with their swatches. They come with half-inch swatches. Out of that, they give you like half a centimeter. And you're supposed to use that half a centimeter swatch to do the sample developments and things like that. So selling and booking of orders is not just about hard selling and making sure that you get maximum number of orders. It's a lot about organizing. Okay, A buying meeting or a selling meeting is a proper meeting and needs to be approached as a meeting. Next thing that we all do, which most of us think is the main function of the merchandiser, but is actually a small part of the function, particularly in today's factories, which have huge production and planning departments. I think they're called PPCs, right? But Ajkal, they have these fancy departments with their ERP systems, though I know of a couple of uh, exporters who actually fill up their ERP system 60 days after the order's been shipped. And that too, they do it because the audit requires them to do it. However, we have guys to do production follow-up. Okay, Our job on production follow-up is basically like a backup system. All right, We are the guys who are reminding them. Okay, Our job is not to tell production how to produce. Leave production to do that job. Okay, Our job is only to lay out the timelines and when they are nearing the timelines to say, hey, buddy, are you moving on time? If you're not, I need to know now. Okay, Our idea is not to tell production how to solve their production problems. That is not our job. However, if production communicates to you that they are having a problem that needs discussion with the buyer, that is your job. Your job is to go and talk to the buyer and come back with solutions from the buyer for production. Okay. Quality control. Now, a lot of people have very often argued with me that what does a merchandiser know about quality control? And I know there might be a lot of technical people here who will 
argue about the fact that how can you make a statement about like this but I quite honestly think and I've experienced it also in my many years as a merchandiser quality is subjective it is subjective to how well the product sells it is also subjective to at what price the product is selling all right you pick up a blouse in Sarojini Nagar market for 150 bucks. Five washes, it falls apart. You pick up a similar blouse from a branded store for 1500 bucks. Five washes and it falls apart. Aajkal to sab chor ho gaye. Ye brand bhi chor hai. Okay. It's subjective. Quality ka pata nahi kya ho gya hai. It's actually happened with me on a shipment with a QC where a QC, uh, I was taking a quality, a commercial quality decision because the merchandise was on promotion. Okay, so it had to ship. And uh, I was actually being very devious and telling the factory how the packing should be done so the color variation in the lots is not noticeable in the distribution, in the store distribution of the merchandise. And Mr. Suresh, who was my merchandiser, was standing there and he was sounding like the Lord of Doom. And he kept telling me, Madam, Zarur Aiga, Clay Maiga, Itna Mota Clay Maiga, Ki Aapki to Nokri Gai, Meri Bhi Gai Uske Saat. I said, Dekh Lenge Jab Aiga Claim. Nay, Nay, Madam, Ya Bohat Galat Kam Kar Rahi Hai. Kyun Suresh Kyun Galat Kam Kar Rahi नहीं ये जा ही नहीं सकता है ये 19-20 का फरक नहीं है ये तो 14-20 का फरक है कलर वेरिएशन में आई सेड लॉट्स में पैक हो रहा है कोई बात नहीं चला जाएगा नाउ आई वाज टेकिंग माय क्वालिटी डिसीजन ऑन द फैक्ट दैट इट वाज अ ब्राट टॉप एंड अ पेयर ऑफ शॉर्ट्स फॉर अ ब्रिटिश बायर फॉर अ समर प्रमोशन प्राइस स्टेड 5 पाउंड 99 ओके अ मैकडॉनल्ड्स मील इन इंग्लैंड कॉस्ट 2.99 so five ninety nine for a set is like practically take it away for free kind of a thing. Yes, we were doing a very large shipment. We were doing a shipment of eighty thousand units. I said let it go. And every morning after the shipment went, I think QCs love doing that. He would come and he would look at me and say, "Anewala, I claim." Anewala. Agya mail claim ka? Nahi aaya Suresh abhi tak nahi. दो हफ्ते हो गए अभी तक क्लेम नहीं आया नहीं आया क्लेम <laughs> तीन हफ्ते हो गए मैडम क्लेम नहीं आया नहीं क्या आया क्लेम चलो आप संतोषी माँ का व्रत करती है ना इसीलिए आफ्टर फाइव वीक्स आई गॉट अ री ऑर्डर ऑन इट फॉर अनदर सिक्सटी थाउजेंड यूनिट्स ओके ना आई एम नॉट सेइंग दैट व्हाट आई डिड वाज राइट राइट there's no way you should compromise on quality. But quality decisions also need to be commercial at time. As merchandisers, okay, ultimately our job is profit planning for our organization. We are responsible for the bottom line. Shipping and documentation. How would the Georges and the Virgis of the world survive without us? If we were not there as backups to check on every document that comes out of the documentation department, compare it to the LC, point out the discrepancies, okay, uh, inform the buyers. Okay, so another very, very important role because we are, after all, responsible to ensure that the merchandise reaches its destination as it's supposed to. Now, I want you to look at this chart. Actually, this was something I had mapped for an ERP company that was trying to develop a, um, an ERP package for uh, somebody I was consulting with. But when I actually sat down to make this chart, I realized, can you see how much external communication takes place between the customer or the buyer and the merchandiser? And at different levels and different phases. Okay? And it interconnects to various areas or arms of the organization. And I was talking to you about how Merchandising is actually the nerve center 
of the organization. It is the nodal point. I'm not getting into greater details on this on the flow chart because uh, we don't have time and this is supposed to be a short workshop. But I think the most important, single most important thing for a merchandiser to know, okay, and what she bases her entire best practice on is the buyer. Okay, the buyer is your business partner. The buyer is the business partner of your organization. He's not your God. Okay, he's not, as I told one of the uh, Mumbai based suppliers at one time, he's not your Maibab. Okay, he's your partner. And as she said, if lines of communication are open, if you trust each other, if conflict is open, okay, there can be a beautiful partnership between your buyer and you. The buyer is not a petulant child. One of the best merchandising best practices that I have always asked my merchandisers to practice is be honest with your buyer. He's as much a part of this business as you are. He needs you as much as you need him. Imagine if all the supply sources were to dry up. Where would his business come from? Okay? China is not God. It won't live forever. Okay? China has huge problems. So do other countries. So ultimately, Ghumfirke, the buyer, is coming back to you. Because he is your business partner. And if you can create that open business partnership, between him, where everything is transparent. Sometimes you find actually the buyer will sit there because after all he's also a merchant. He will sit there try to give you solutions of how you can overcome problems that you might be facing in sending him a shipment. The reason why he placed an order on you is not because he wants to cancel the order. He placed the order on you because he needs the merchandise. It's his merchandise, his business is hinging on that. So why do we all the time behave like, Are buyer ko mat bolna, order cancel ho jayega. Okay? The reason that happens is because we are not preemptive. When we see a problem, we have this ostrich-like attitude thinking, solve ho jayega. Abhi time hai. Ho jayega, theek. Abhi time hai. When you're having color variation problems on the first color run, Inform the buyer then, so that mentally he's also prepared. Ki, all right, there is a problem happening. Maybe there will be a situation when they will want. So mentally he's prepared to give you the extension. So mentally when he receives the order, absolutely hunky-dory, he's happy. Ki order ban ke aaya. All right. So essentially, if we actually look at our buyers and see what they do, we find that their functions are very similar to ours as merchandisers. They also have to be product people. They also have to understand sourcing and product development. They also do a lot of planning like we do. They also do pricing and costing. Okay, And they also sell. So basically, the buyer is a merchant and the merchant is a buyer. In fact, the word merchant has the answer in it. A merchant is who is a merchant? Who is a merchant as per the dictionary? A trader. Someone who trades. You're trading, your buyer is trading. So all of you are merchants. And therefore, if there is clarity and transparency between the two of you, okay, if there is a partnership between the two of you, a partnership that is based on that pyramid that was shown to you by Anjali, where conflicts are brought out in the open, where decisions are taken jo jointly, where listening, empathetic listening happens, where the lines of communications are kept open at all times, why should there be a problem? You'd be the world's best merchants, practicing the best practices. So to quickly go through this again, whoops, sorry. Ah. Essentially, this is what your buyer is doing. I'll probably share the slides with you through uh, OGTC, so you can get into details about it. But I think we are really short on time, so 
uh, I'm just going to quickly talk through this. And what I had actually done was I had actually set up different areas uh, elucidating practices that a lot of people practice, a lot of companies are practicing now, modern day big companies, where they are actually systematically developing the system of functions. And this is what is making them successful in their businesses. And I'm not just talking of export organizations. This is also happening with people who are in the domestic retail industry. So essentially, I've tried to list the kind of systems and documentations you need to follow these best practices. Uh, essentially, in the buyer contact and communication area, we talk about company profiles, buyer profile, and product information. Nine out of ten companies don't have clarity in this. Okay, We send samples to um, buyers which are not clearly labeled. So then zillions of mails fly back and forth about the fabric, about the color, about the minimum quantities, about the print verb, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Most of our covering letters don't communicate this clearly to them. Yeah? How many of you have sent mails up and down 20 times? Clarifying. Colorways available? I haven't. I've said black and white, and then they've come back and said, can you do it in red? And I said, yeah, maybe we can do it in red. OK, what about yellow? Yeah, we can do it in yellow too. First shot, I should have told him. All colorways is possible in it. Or all colorways with the exception of turquoise blue and parrot green. Okay. In the product development, there's a huge amount of communication and best practices systems that can happen. Uh, here, unfortunately, unless we are working with well-known American brands like Abercrombie and Fitch or Gap, we don't really believe in a sampling docket. Or we have a sampling docket, but it's incomplete. Either the fabric swatch card is missing, or the trim sheet is missing, or the line sheet is missing, or the specification sheet is missing. Something is missing. And the one that's always missing is information on the sample tag, which is something I want to show you. Most of us don't fill up sample tags. I have walked into zillions of buying meetings where beautiful samples are hanging saying ABC exports. Style number, blank. Fabric, blank. Price, blank. Minimum quantities, blank. And then it's pulled out and it said, oh, I love this style. What are we going to call it? We'll name it after you, Peter. We will call it Peter 1. Style number, Peter 1. The next day, Anant walks in. Nice sample. I don't like the style number, Peter 1. We'll call it after you, Anant. Anant 1. Now what happens? Production gets a docket where he doesn't know that Peter 1 and Anant 1 are the same people or the same style. All right? So we have, we have the infrastructure. We have the backup. We just don't practice it. Now, even this is the face of your company. I have received samples from suppliers very often where sample cards have come to me just with the style number on it for buyer's approvals. Now, what does it indicate to the buyer? That you're not really that into your merchandise. Sample manga bej diya. Order doge doge na doge ko yor de de ka say. Right? So these are some things that we need to introspect on. We never go into a buying meeting with an agenda. Now, when I used to work for CNA, you couldn't enter a buying meeting without an agenda. If you didn't have an agenda, the buyer wouldn't see you. All right? Yeah. What do you need to have in an agenda? You'd say, what is there to discuss in a buying meeting? There's a lot to discuss in a buying meeting. Pre-buying discussions, because this is the only time you have the buyer captive face-to-face. -face. Nowadays, they come once every three months, so you've got them captive once every three months. For you to discuss past season, pending orders, extensions that you want, all of that can happen face-to-face. -face. If you have a systematic agenda like this, you can then actually make your notes on the basis of the agenda. 
So then the next day when you come back to office, your diary doesn't look like it's been written in Greek. Okay. Buying reports. Very often I find, by very often, uh, more often than not, buying offices maintain this. Very rarely have I seen a manufacturer maintain this. Okay, Where you actually write down points that were discussed. This is like the minutes of a meeting. Okay, Every time we have an organization meeting, we happily minute it. And we also say who's going to do what, by when, and whatever. But the most important meeting that is giving us business, which is a meeting with the buyer, we don't minute. Okay, Now imagine if you were to send this report to the buyer. Later on, he can't turn around and say, but I never said this. When you send this to him by email within a day of your meeting with him, if he has to come back to you on something, immediately he'll say, hey, this is not what I meant. This is what we meant. Again, when we talked about putting everything on the table, documenting it. These are, of course, some things on production follow-up. As I said, I'll give you the slides, or else you can talk to me. But all in all, basically, I wanted to talk to you about what goes into a production docket. Again, we send our production docket's incomplete, and therefore the production department is pulling its hair out most of the time, because we're saying, ab ye sab raklo, swatches baad mein bhejenge. Ye, ye sab raklo, buttons abhi approve ho rahe. Approve hone ke baad bhejenge buttons. And then in the hurly-burly of our daily lives, we tend to forget that. And the production goes online, and then suddenly somebody wakes up and says, oh, labels nahi hai. Buttons nahi approve hoi. Okay, so all our laces and whatever. Packaging, and that's it. Sorry, <laughs> I overshot. Thank you.